Well, welcome everyone. Uh, hopefully you had a great day. We're gonna talk about adhesion tonight. Now I'm assuming many of you are already doing adhesion, right? It's kind of like riding a bike. You know, you learn some things, you, you find some tricks along the way, but for the most part, the systems haven't changed a whole lot. And yet so many people still have questions and concerns. And so that's why we're here. We're here to answer questions. We're here to help you get to a different place. So hopefully you can feel more comfortable. And after you've done enough repetitions in anything, obviously you can look back and say, wow, it wasn't that challenging. It was a matter of just getting a lot of repetitions under my belt to, to feel comfortable in doing something. So with that being said, let's talk about how we adhere ceramics to tooth structure. Uh, you know, materials have changed a little bit. But for the most part, like I said, the, the concepts are very much the same. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some materials and we're going to talk a little about the actual procedures involved with that. So as I'm going along, you know, I take things for granted sometimes and the whole audience would probably benefit from certain questions. So if you have a question that comes to mind, write it in the Q&A section so that I can see that and answer it for you later on if I didn't address it during the program. OK, perfect. All right. So. Think about adhesive dentistry. When do you decide how you're gonna use materials? Do you decide the day the patient's already been prepared and in the chair and the ceramics are coming back from the lab? Is that the time we make a decision on what we're gonna use and how we're gonna put things in? Or do we decide the day we temporize things? Or do we decide the day we treatment plan? You know, when we're presenting a treatment plan to the patient, are we already deciding at that point in time that, you know, what it's going to take to do things, how we're going to be adhering things, you know, the materials that might be involved and therefore the price that must, must be derived from all of that. You know, so at what point do you decide what materials you're utilizing? Okay. Now from there, based on what you're deciding to utilize, do you use that same product for everywhere? You know, because a lot of times as dentists, we like to have one thing to do everything. And certainly there's some products that can do that. But to some extent, based on the situation you have, maybe all teeth aren't going to need the same type of technique or same materials. And so we're going to talk about that as far as what do you use and when, and how do you decide that? You know, when do you decide that? And what's the plan? What are the plan, the steps, the sequences that have to go into it so that you're not scared or frustrated or concerned that you get a predictable result by the time you're done, you're happy with things and you're confident that it's going to last a long time for your patient. But that's ultimately the goal of going through training, right, is, is to allay our fears and to learn a sequential step for most of our cases that once we've put that into a process where we treated enough patients, we feel comfortable, right? And so we do it over and over again at that point. So really the fear of, you know, not doing things correct is usually just because we haven't done enough repetitions. So in looking at this case, you know, you can see we got a lot going on here. We got someone that has had a bridge, you know, from number six to number eight, uh, the bridge has been sectioned so we could place an implant. And then they've got a crown over on probably a peg lateral, looks like number 10. And then we got virgin teeth, number nine and number 11. So you could say, well, we could certainly crown all of these, right? And if we crown things, it makes life easy. The ceramist has the same uniform thickness everywhere that's easy for him to fabricate something. And to some extent, it's easy if you've got enough tooth structure that you can cement things very easily as opposed to doing adhesives, right? But if you have short tooth structure, uh, maybe as a lot of taper to the tooth and there's just not a lot to grab onto for a cement, then you're going to have to use various types of adhesives. So let's talk about how we can approach this. One way is to crown everything. Another way would be crown some teeth and veneer some others. And so you're going, wow, this might be a little more challenging now. It can be. We got to make sure we have enough space for the ceramists to do their magic on the veneers so that they can actually get those to look like crowns, right? Now, you've got two structure here. You've got a little bit of enamel on some teeth. You've got dentin exposed on others. And so you might go, all right, well, I got two different substrates. You know, how do I handle each one of these? You know, can I just do one thing for all of them? Yes, you certainly can. You can do both. You can certainly do like a selective etch. You could do a total etch. And to some extent, you could do cementation on some teeth and then just do adhesive dentistry on the veneers. So you have options here. So the first thing to understand, obviously, is we all do things differently. There is not one right way to treat anybody. There's a lot of different ways. And so looking at this case, I threw this in here specifically so we can talk about, hey, you've got numerous substrates to deal with. You deal with it every day. Enamel and dentin, sclerotic dentin, deep dentin, superficial dentin. They're all a little different. But if we have a systematic approach, we can make it very easy for us. 
So what is that approach? You know, how do, how do, we, how do we address this? Well, as I said, the first thing I think of when I'm treatment planning a case is what's the occlusion going to be like? And based on the occlusion, that's going to determine if I can cement something or if it has to be you know, literally glued to the tooth. From there, how much tooth am I going to have? And sometimes you don't know if they got existing crowns, you're going to have to take them off. You're going to have to look, right? So you may have to pull an audible. You may have to go sideways for a second and go, oh, wait, I'm going to have to change this now. But so long as you have the protocols down, again, it's very easy to make you know, an audible and do something slightly different. From there, your preparation design. Obviously, we always want to have a good preparation design. We want to have a nice uh, taper to it, you know, about a six to eight degree taper. We want to have a long axial wall, you know, so that we have good retention and resistance. Because ideally, we don't want to rely solely on adhesion for a lot of our dentistry. We want to have some kind of mechanical retention built in to give it some durability and strength. Now, when you veneer a tooth, you're laminating the tooth. Most of what, you know, what we're doing is adhering something onto the front of a tooth. And occasionally, you know, it wraps around to the lingual or to the interproximal areas. But for the most part, we're laminating the front of the tooth. And so in doing so, we've got a large surface area to grab onto. And ideally, if that's enamel, that gives us our longest lasting bonds possible. But we're not always that lucky. You know, sometimes we're on dentin. And so with dentin, we get the highest bond strengths, but we know those bond strengths aren't as long lasting. So obviously in our preparation design, we're trying to stay in as much enamel wherever possible or keep enamel on margins so that we can have a nice long-term seal next to the gum line. From there, we're starting to think about, hey, how wide can this patient open? Can I get in there? Can I put on a rubber dam? Can I isolate it with cotton rolls or a, uh, an isolate? You know, will I be able to isolate this well enough to do adhesive dentistry? And to some extent, you may be determining that partly while you're prepping the teeth also. You may realize you thought you were going to do adhesive during the diagnostic phase, and then you're prepping the teeth and realize, wow, this patient's going to be very difficult. And because of that, you might pull an audible and say, you know what, I think I'm going to have to use some cements for this person because trying to adhere things might be a nightmare, right? So, you know, the question is always going to be cementation versus adhesion. And so you have those two options and you can audible on those. With adhesion, you've got either light cured or dual cured. And the way we base those is, is, again, what type of material we're utilizing, right? Is it, is it a thick ceramic? Is it thin ceramic? Is it you know, like a zirconia that's very opacous that light doesn't penetrate through? Are we worried about darkness that light can't get to the restorative resin adhesives that are going to hold the ceramic in place? And so for the most part, we're trying to determine which we're utilizing based on can light get to it. That's really one of the main components. The only other component is we want something that's not going to have a color shift if we have thin glass or thin ceramics. And then we would want to use light cured, obviously, for those thinner ceramics where we might get a change in the resin underneath. And if that resin changes color, that would create a problem. Well, we see more of a color shift in dual cured resin adhesives as compared to light cured. So we're thinking of all of these things during the diagnostic phase. We're thinking about it again right here at the preparation phase. You know, we're starting to just get ready to start taking impressions and photographs of things. It's like, you know, what? I just want to make sure I can do what I want. And if I can, right now is the time you want to make that decision if you're going to call an audible. Okay. All right. So you've got light cured adhesion, dual cured adhesion, and you've got cementation. So for the most part, we're talking about obviously about adhesion tonight. Cementation is very easy to fall back on, put some cement in there, whether it's a bioactive cement or something else. Uh, you know, to put something in there very quick and easy and put it on a tooth, we've all been doing for years, you know, glass onomers, for example. And so really, we're going to focus our attention on light cured and dual cured for this program tonight. Now, for some of you, you may be asking questions like, hey, wait a minute, you, you know, we're talking about some veneer cementation here and, and potentially some crowns. What about all the steps that led up to it? What about the diagnosis? What about the wax ups? You know, how do you make provisionals? How do you prep all these teeth? You know, those are a lot of great questions. And so all of those, for the most part, I answered earlier in a, a webinar that we did on Catapult. So you might go back through Catapult's database and look for me, Todd Snyder, and you'll find a really nice program there that we went over all of those different topics. Granted, an hour is not a lot of time to share, but there's a lot of solid information in there. So that's really kind of like the predecessor to this one if you're having questions on that. Okay, so light cured adhesion is what we're going to start with here, because really, if, if you understand light cured adhesion, dual cure becomes very simplistic. So we're going to start with light cured. So you've done everything to get to the point of having a patient in provisional, and they're coming back in to see you to get that ceramic restoration to be glued onto the tooth. And so we have our uh, veneer here, 
Veneer comes back from the laboratory. First thing we want to do is put our loops on. Why do we want to put loops on? Well, we want to be able to see things, see things very closely, see things up front, right? We want to be able to make sure we get a really good idea of how well they've done the etching on this. And you figure it's, it's not that hard to really etch a piece of ceramic, right? So the only place really that you want to spend a little extra time is along the margins. Now, the margins are important because that's what seals things. You don't want to have a brown or, or, or a kind of a leakage line, let's say, over time. You know, when a patient comes back for a hygiene recall and you see this little kind of scuzz line around the margins because it wasn't sealed well. Well, sometimes that's going to happen if you don't actually etch the ceramic properly. So you'll notice here in this example, I've got a veneer where you'll see this frosty area that's been etched extremely well all the way out to the margin. Now, on the lower left-hand side, you'll see it has kind of a shiny shimmer. This area was not etched well. And I'm making a big point of this to show you what it would look like. Now, you want to make sure really just along those edges, it's frosty, because usually they'll do a good job everywhere else. But if it's not frosty all the way out to the edge, you're going to need to etch that. Now, the only exception being if you're using zirconia. So if you're using feldspathic porcelains, lucite-based, lithium disilicates, all of those you want to etch. All right, so a porcelain etchant. You can get porcelain etchants from many different companies, right? So take your pick where you wanna get it. The one I'm showing you here happens to be from Bisco. It's the one I use. And so their porcelain etchant is a 9.5% hydrofluoric acid. And so the left-hand side, you can see this nice long paragraph here as far as how you would implement this, okay? So when applying this onto the dry porcelain, you're gonna allow it to sit there for 90 seconds. You wanna try and make sure it doesn't get on the opposite side because once it gets to the opposite side, it's gonna change the, the physical properties of that ceramic a little bit, right? It's gonna make it slightly porous, might change the color a little bit. But the bigger thing is you're now gonna get resins to adhere to the pretty smooth surface that ceramics took all that time to make. And so you don't want that to happen. So you'll be very careful. If it does happen, it's not the end of the world, but ideally you don't want it to be out there, okay? So after you've uh, etched this properly, you want to go ahead and then rinse that off and dry it. Now, the surface, as I mentioned, should have that kind of frosty look to it, right? We can tell we've gone all the way out to the edges if it's frosty, hence you want to be wearing those loops. From there, if the porcelain has a white chalky appearance, you know, you're going to want to agitate that with a moist micro brush to try and drive off that salt debris. Now, you could also take this and stick it in uh, an alcohol or acetone water bath. Me personally, I like steam cleaners. Uh, so I use those regularly to, to remove that. From there, you're going to place a silane on it. We'll talk about silanes in just a minute. So all of this tiny little font over here is for you. Because let's face it, when you get done tonight, you may be taking a bunch of notes and you may not remember certain things. And so I want you to be able to go back, the same as me sitting in a lecture. I want to have good notes. So these notes are specifically for you. There is a handout at the end that gives you every slide I'm showing you. So for the most part, that slide's got everything you're going to have here or that handout, I should say. And so anything I say verbally, you might want to write down, but otherwise you can have every slide I'm showing you with all the notes on it. It's there for a reason, it's for you, okay? I'll tell you how to get that at the end. All right, so you have your porcelain etching on there. After 90 seconds, you're gonna go ahead and rinse that off. Me personally, I said, I like to use a steam cleaner. Okay, so lots of different steam cleaners on the market, anywhere from about $600 to $1,200. You can get jewelry steam cleaners. You can also buy dental steam cleaners. You decide which one's cheaper. They both do the same thing, okay? The wonderful thing about steam cleaners, they obviously not only can remove debris, but they also kill bacteria. Anything over 100 degrees as you're hitting the bacteria with this heated source of air and steam, uh, basically they denature and die off, right? So we kill bugs at the same time, wonderful. All right, so we're decontaminating and removing debris. So from there, as I said, you gotta put a silane on. So silanes. There's a lot of companies out there. Again, we've got Bisco products on the left. We're going to talk about those. On the right-hand side, we have Premier and we have Sultan. They make individual vials. You can see a glass vial and a plastic vial. These are one-time use. The beauty of these is that when you use it, you know it's going to be the right chemistry inside. And when you're done, you throw it away. It's a one-time use. Now, if you're someone who's doing a number of cases and that little bottle or little vial doesn't do enough for you because you have more teeth than that little vial offers, and that's why most of us typically use what's on the left-hand side, which is what you're seeing here from Bisco. You've got a single bottle system, just like the others, but it's got a lot more liquid in it, right? It's got a lot more silane. The reason there's, there's more there is so you can put more out to do more teeth, right? Or more restorations, I should say. Now, if you say, well, hey, I don't do that many, 
Uh, is, is there something different that I could use? Maybe it has a longer shelf life. Sure. So you'll notice there's a, a bisilane A and B. There's two bottles on the left-hand side. Now they're separated. The water that basically is part of the chemistry of a silane is separated. So you get longer shelf life. So if you're not doing a lot of ceramics, this is probably your best bet. So you get more longevity for your money. But if you're doing a lot and you don't want to be mixing, you know, one drop of each together and, you know, uh, mixing them, then a single bottle system usually is going to work better. So the, the single systems are pre-hydrolyzed. They have water already inside of them. The dual bottle systems, the water is separated. So the chemistries are separated, so you get better longevity. That's the only difference between them. Otherwise, they work the same, okay? So from there, if you picked a silane from whatever company you want to implement, you'll notice here I'm painting it on the inside. You'll see it's actually pooled on the right-hand side. Now, as far as pooling the material, you don't need this much. I'm just showing you that you know, when you're putting this on, you're covering everything in its entirety, right? So again, you don't need to use this much, but I wanted you to see that it's there, it's covering everything. But you'll notice how the frostiness goes away, okay? Now, silanes are important because silanes allow us to basically couple, uh, or it's kind of an intermediary, intermediary uh, product, which allows us to bond an organic material to an inorganic material. So it allows you to bond the resin to the ceramic. Okay. So this is a necessary step that you have to have. Again, whether it's a two bottle system or a single bottle system, this is a step you must get right. Okay. All right. From there, someone's coming in and has the provisionals on. So all the steps I just showed you could have already been done ahead of time. So when you get that case from the lab, you could have done all of this a week before, a day before, an hour before, or two minutes before. Or maybe you just numbed them up and while they're getting anesthetized, you're going into the lab and you're doing it right then and there. Now, me personally, I don't want to find a flaw at that point, so I'm doing it ahead of time. All right. So if we take the provisionals off, we now have to obviously try things in. Okay. So the first thing we got to do when we take the provisionals off is we have to clean the tooth structure. So in cleaning the tooth, we have a number of different options, and I'll show you what those are. Once we've done that, we use water-soluble try-and paste inside the ceramic. Okay, we're going to optically connect them to the tooth structure. And then after we've done that, we're going to clean the tooth again. So what can we clean the tooth with? You know, we take off the provisional, we might have a little bit of micro leakage or something there. So we got to clean the tooth. We got to make it nice and clean. One of the things we can use is this one here from Whitmix. It's known as Preppies. And so this looks like fluoridated profi paste that we'd use every day for our hygiene patients, but it's not. Okay. It is literally just pumice. Now they're individual. They're nice because you can just put one on the table and use it. But if you want to buy just a large, large tub of, you know, flower pumice and add a little water to it, it's probably far cheaper, but nonetheless, that's one way to approach it. Okay. So you use a little rubber cup, make sure you don't hit the gum line. You don't want to cause any bleeding, but this is one way to clean the tooth. Now, another way, a micro etcher, this one happens to be from Danville. Okay, so we're shooting little aluminum oxide particles at a low pressure to clean off any debris. Okay, so that's freshening up the tooth structure while it's cleaning things. Again, be careful not to hit the gum tissue. Okay, we don't want bleeding. It's going to be hard to adhere things if it's bleeding. Here's another example. Curhave makes the OptiClean. Now, the OptiClean is literally a slow speed latch plastic handpiece burr that has almost like a polishing compound, the same you'd use like polish a composite. And so these little cylindrical kind of rubberized polishers, they kind of degrade the same as your polishing points. And so when you're going across the tooth, it's cleaning things off, but at the same time, there's little bits of this, you know, blue material kind of degrading, kind of coming off the same as when you're polishing a composite, okay? So it's not hurting anything, it's breaking down, it won't damage the tooth. Uh, so this is my personal favorite because I'm not damaging anything and it's far easier to rinse out and clean up, okay? All right. So from here, we now have the try-in. And so for the try-in, obviously you'll adjust the ceramics to make sure they fit if they're tight and approximately. But what we're trying it in with is some type of water-soluble try-in paste. Now I hear some people say, well, I use water. Problem with water oftentimes is the second you put that on a tooth, the water then leaches out from underneath or gets absorbed into the tooth structure. And now you have a small air space or, or gap between the veneer and the tooth. And because of that, your veneer is going to look whiter. So it's misleading. So if you're allowing the patient to take a look at the veneers before you adhere them to the tooth structure, they're going to be misled. And potentially it's going to be warmer once you adhere it to the tooth. 
And if it's warmer and they were expecting whiter, now you're gonna have a problem when you hold up the mirror when you're done gluing things in, okay? So you always wanna use a water soluble try-in paste. Now I would also say water soluble because you want it to rinse away quickly and easily. You don't wanna have a bunch of cleanup at this point, right? If you wanna go back and clean the tooth again with one of those little Curajave polishers, you can, but since it's water soluble, usually you just rinse it very well. Just a bunch of rinsing to make sure you've got everything off to completion. Okay. All right. Now me personally, I'll go back and steam clean the veneer again. And so I've taken the veneer back out of the mouth. It's got debris on it, right? It's got saliva and contaminants on it. So I'm going to steam clean it again. So if the slide looks the same, it is. Okay. So I'm steam cleaning it again. Now you may say, well, Hey, wait a minute. Does that mean I got to go back and etch it again? Or do I got to silenate it again? You don't have to etch it again. Okay. Would I silenate it again? Me personally, yes, I would. I'm just particular like that, okay? Do you have to? Not necessarily, but I do just because I want it to be as flawless as possible, okay? All right, and again, if you don't have a, a steam cleaner, you can certainly use an acetone or alcohol um, ultrasonic uh, to clean the veneers as well, okay? I just like the steam cleaner. Okay, from here, now you've got the ceramic, it's ready. It's been etched, it's been tried in, it's got the silane on it, okay? So it's all set to go. From here, we wanna isolate the teeth very well. So whether you're using rubber dam, an isolite, uh, in this case, I've got an Ivoclar Optrigate. I've got a little bit of Mylar strips in there. I know some people will use like uh, Teflon plumber's tape. And so there's a lot of different things in which you can utilize here. So you've got this nice clean surface to work on and you now have to treat this because of all the steps you've done, you've got to treat this very well with your technique. And so with your technique, you need to be very good at obviously isolation. That means anytime you turn away to pick something up, your assistant obviously is keeping the area clean and dry. You want to make sure there's no contamination, but all the steps have to be flawless. And that's really what we're here to talk about, the flawless steps. So in the case of a veneer, as I mentioned, we're using light cured resins because they're more color stable. We can put a lot of veneers in and move them around and play with them for a while, so long as we don't have our overhead light you know, coming down on them, because your overhead light will cause things to set up, okay? So, but it gives you more working time to play with things until you're ready to cure the resin. Versus if you're using a dual cured resin and you're trying to move things around, something's gonna start hardening and now you can't move it. So you do not wanna be using dual cured resins on veneers. Okay, so if we have thin or translucent ceramics, where light can pass through, well, that's a time to use light cured resin cements. So if you've got a crown that has very thin uh, ceramics or it has a lot of translucency, uh, then you could use light cured resins. You have inlays and onlays, the same thing, okay? No matter where you're on the tooth, whether on enamel or dentin, you can use light cured resins. If you're wanting to do a total etch or a self etch, you can still use light cured resins, right? So we're keeping it simple. Now, as far as shade selection, you've got a lot of different shades available. 99% of the time I'm using a translucent, but every once in a blue moon, I will grab either a milky white or something with a little warmth, a little chroma to it, okay? Now dual cure resins, really not much different other than delivery, right? They're dual barrel versus a single barrel. And because of their reaction being chemical, they're gonna have a little more of a color shift over time. And that's why we said we're not using them for ceramics that are thin or that color shift over time may change the appearance of your ceramic, which we don't wanna have happen. But for the same thing I mentioned earlier with any resin, we can use them on enamel and dentin. We can use a total etch or a self etch or selective etch too, right? So again, really very simplistic here is what we're trying to say. And again, shade selection, some of them have universal, others have Vita shades. Again, you decide what you want to implement, but they have some different shades just like like here. All right. So let's look at the system I'm using. So as a, a researcher, uh, you know, evaluator for numerous different companies, as well as different organizations like Reality and Catapult, uh, obviously I get to evaluate materials. And so I've tried everything out there and I have my personal favorite, the same as you have personal favorites for materials in your office. And so choice two, the reason I implement this in my office, number one, I like that it has a very thin film thickness. It flows easily. So if I have thin feldspathic veneers, I'm not worried about pushing them down and breaking them. You know, I'm still being careful, but I'm not worried as much about breaking them as some other materials, other resins that are thick, and you've got to push firmly to get them to displace. 
Okay. Now, the other thing I like about it is I like that they have a complete system that everything's in one place for me. So they have everything I need. They have the etchant for the porcelain. They have the etchant for the two structure. They have the silane for me. They have the bonding agent, a universal bonding agent for everything that I need to do. Um, and I can use the same bonding agent for all my direct restorations as well as my indirects, right? So one system for everything. They also have an unfilled resin, which I'll tell you what that wonderful material is for. And then they've got all these different shades of obviously looting resins, these light curable resins for my veneers. And they have try and paste to match and they match very well, which is nice also, okay? So that's why I personally implement this in my office. So as I mentioned, we did all the steps previously. We now isolated the teeth. We're etching the tooth structure. Me personally, I'm doing a total etch. I'm etching the enamel and the dentin. Kind of hard to etch just the enamel and not the dentin. Now for a single tooth for a filling, far easier, right? But if you're doing like six, eight, 10, 12 teeth, very difficult to etch just the enamel and nothing else. And by that time you've etched everything for like a minute, minute and a half. So me personally, I'm all in, I etch everything. But if you wanted to be careful and etch just the enamel, you certainly can, okay? It's your choice. So the reason I've got the mylar strips in here is so I'm not etching the adjacent teeth. So I'm not bonding to them. So it makes my cleanup far easier, all right? Now, as far as etchants, again, it comes with an etchant. So you've got your uni etch that comes in as 32% uh, phosphoric acid. It has benzoclonium chloride. A lot of people think phosphoric acid by itself would kill bugs. And you think, well, like, yeah, an acid, right? It's like, no, phosphoric acid does not get rid of or kill the bugs. It might wash some away, but it's not killing them. Now, so Bisco took the time to say, hey, look, let's put some benzoclonium chloride in there. That will kill bugs. So then we're less concerned about contaminants on the tooth structure, right? So well thought out to add that in there. Now, if your someone says, hey, wait a minute, I'm not etching everything. Well, that's fine. That's each person's prerogative, right? And you say, well, if you want to etch just the enamel, you can be careful because some of the etchants are a little runny. They're going to get onto the dentin as well. And so with that, I would say, go ahead and use the selective HV etch. And by using this product, it's a 35% phosphoric acid, still has your benzoclonium chloride in it, but it, it's a little thicker. Now, the nice thing about that is it stays where you put it. Still washes away clean and easy, but it's nice that it stays where you put it, okay? So after you've gone ahead and etched the two structure, you're gonna apply your bonding agent. And again, as I mentioned, I'm using the all bond universal. And I'll tell you why in a moment. But you'll notice the teeth here, they shouldn't be this dry, but I'm showing it to you this way on purpose. I want you to see that, hey, we've got a tooth that's fairly dry. It should be moist, but it's fairly dry. And from here, when I'm adding in my bonding agent, again, all bond universal, I wanna make sure I apply enough coats. I'm putting on enough that it's you know, embedded into the tooth well. I've coated everything to completion and it's soaked in. I see some dentists doing my hands-on programs where they just put a little bit on trying to save some money. You know, there's a time and place to save money. This is not one of them. You don't wanna have a failure or a problem and have to do this whole thing over and eat all the costs. So again, put a little extra on, make sure it gets into the tooth to completion. If you're using it as a self etch or a selective etch, every time you put that on the tooth, the acidity of the product going onto the tooth with any product, the acidity gets neutralized when it touches the tooth structure. Okay, so if you just put it on once, well, it didn't do much because as you spread it out, the acidity goes away pretty quickly. So you got to keep putting multiple coats on and usually they'll tell you, you got to scrub it in or rub it on the tooth for like 20 seconds to really work it into the tooth. If you put a timer on, 20 seconds is a long time. And if you're doing it on multiple teeth, like that takes a little bit of time. So I want you to recognize that because one of the biggest mistakes I see when people talk about sensitivity or leakage is that they're not doing these steps well, okay? So again, why do I use this bonding agent? Well, I like it number one, because it's very easy to use. You know, a lot of bonding agents have two bottles and extra steps and things. I like having the simplicity of one system, but if that one bottle doesn't work well, then I don't want it obviously. So I want a bottle that has a good track record. And this is one of them on the market. Now, the other thing, if I'm doing veneers and I do a lot of them, I wanna make sure when I put my bonding agent on that when I thin it properly with air, I have an extremely small film thickness, okay? If I have a thick film thickness, my veneer is not gonna seat. I want it very thin. So one of the things about this, it works for self etch, total etch, selective etch, but at the same time has a very thin film thickness of less than 10 microns, okay? It's compatible with all the cements, which is great. I don't have to use an additional bottle as far as an activator if I'm doing dual cure. And as I mentioned, I can use this for my direct restorations as well. So it's a really well thought out product, makes my life easy and that's why I implement it. All right, so going back to this, we said it was dry. 
you'll notice here, I'm putting on multiple coats. You can see it pooling on the tooth, right? I'm not worry about a couple extra pennies or dollars here. I wanna make sure this works extremely well for the patient so they're happy and it lasts a lifetime or at least a long time. All right, so in putting that on there, multiple coats, scrubbing in, allowing it to do its magic, you know, going in there for like 20 seconds. And once that's done, it's, you know, seeped into the tooth quite well. I then have to grab my air water syringe and evaporate off the volatile solvents. Now it can take a good 10 to 15 seconds to evaporate all the volatile solvents and displace all the extra resin. So you wanna make sure you do this well also, because if you have pooling, your veneer or your restoration is not going to seat properly, right? So you gotta be careful. Now the all bond is ethanol based, okay? And it's got a little bit of water in there. So you gotta make sure you evaporate this off. Now some manufacturers have a lot more water, okay? And it takes longer to evaporate theirs off. And again, if you measure 10 to 15 seconds, or for some systems, it's even longer, you'll recognize that, wow, that's a long time. Maybe I'm not evaporating off the solvents well enough, okay? So again, timers are important to understand how much time things take. Now from here, we're gonna go ahead and light cure. We're gonna cure this in place. And so this is grabbed onto the tooth. The tooth is now sealed well. And the next step we're gonna do after curing this is we're gonna go back to our veneers. So our veneers, this is where I said that special bottle. This bottle of uh, hema-free unfilled resin. So understand that this has no strength property to it. All right, this is literally an unfilled resin. You're going like, well, what the heck would I use that for? It's, it doesn't have any strength properties. That seems odd. Okay, think about going back to dental school. Unless you still pour up your own models, which which I do. Uh, think of the debubbleizer, the surfactant. It's oftentimes, it's a pink spray that you'd spray on an alginate before you put the stone uh, in there on the the vibrator. And so the reason you sprayed your alginate with that surfactant was to break the surface tension to allow your stone material to flow more easily into all the little grooves of the impression, right? So you didn't have bubbles or porosities or problems. Well, to some extent, this is doing the same thing. This step is not mandatory, right? Because it doesn't have any strength. What it's doing, it's making sure that when you put your resin looting cement in there, that it flows more easily to get into all the little nooks and crannies from you having etched that porcelain. So you don't have with a little tiny void that's a little like an air bubble under the surface, or eventually if the air bubble had a little contaminant in there, you might get a little discoloration, like a little brown mark under the surface. Yeah, it's happened. You know? So hence I pointed out, this becomes a good step to understand. So it's not necessary, but I sure would utilize it personally because I've seen what can happen if you don't, all right? So that's the purpose of this. So they put this in the choice two kit to make it easy for you. All right. From here, putting in your resin looting cement. All right. So again, as I mentioned, the majority of mine are translucent, but I have multiple color choices if I'm trying to get a tiny little color pop. Right? It's not a big influence, but there is a little color pop. So this particular material ties in with the try and paste that I had used. Okay, So the water soluble try and paste closely mimics this, so I know that I'm going to get the same appearance when I'm done. Now, the other beauty of this material, as I said, uh, it flows very easily. So I like that when I'm seeding thin veneers that I don't have to worry about pressing hard to displace it. Okay? It cleans up easy as well. But as I mentioned, light cured, they don't have the color shift that dual cures have. And so this one is specifically formulated for doing veneers for cosmetic purposes. And it's color shift that's perceivable, you know, it's measurable as far as a Delta E is less than 1.2. So it's very minimal. Okay. So you really can't perceive that change. That's what you want because you don't want the veneer to change color over time. All right, so this is why I'm implementing. So if I've put this into the veneer, I'm now going to sandwich the veneer onto the tooth. And having done so, you'll see this excess start to come out, right? I wanna see it's come out 360 degrees out of every margin. If it didn't, I'm gonna pull that veneer back off. I'm gonna put a little more in, I'm gonna push it down again. I wanna see it again. I don't wanna have a very small area in a margin that didn't get resin. Okay, so I want to make sure I can see it everywhere. So I make sure to put a uniform coating everywhere. So I'm not having to worry too much that resin has to move a lot underneath the veneer that I pretty much coated it already in the beginning. Now, some of you may say, well, hey, I see people putting resin on the tooth and then they take the veneer and push it onto the resin that's on the tooth. You can certainly do it that way too. Me personally, I like to think of the veneer as a bowl. I'm going to put it in the bowl and make sure I've got it everywhere it needs to be and then push it on the tooth and watch the excess come out around all the margins. Okay. But again, you can do it either way. From here, there's a couple of questions that usually come up. 
And so you can do one of two things. You can either tack a veneer in place and then clean off the gross excess. I personally don't do this, but I know a lot of people do. Me personally, when I have the veneer on there with the excess, I'm going to wipe off about 80% of the excess at the gum line. I don't want to wipe on the margins because I'm afraid potentially I'll pull a little bit out of a margin that I can't see. And by having pulled that out of a margin, now you have the risk of leakage or a brown line later on, which I don't want because you can't go back and seal that up. Okay. Now you may say, well, hey, what about the interproximal contact? If you're not cleaning off all your margins, if you're not flossing, you're going to have to go back and clean that out. Yes, you do. And it's a little more challenging, right? But here's the problem for me, at least. If I go in and try to uh, spot a uh, cure a veneer and I want to potentially clean through there, if I pull something out of a margin, I can't go back and take it off and add more resin. Furthermore, I can't even see in there. So if I floss the contact because I'm trying to clean off all the resin to make my life easy, and now I've left like an open margin or a place that's going to leak, that's a problem. I don't want that to happen to the patient. I don't want it to happen to me. And so what, again, I just wipe off the gross excess that I can access. I don't floss. I don't want to disturb the gum tissue and cause any bleeding. I don't want to potentially have something that's displaced after I was trying to cure it. And now I got to try and figure out how to put it back on because there's a little spot of light cured resin, right? So there's a lot of flaws that could happen. I'm trying to avoid all those. So again, wipe off the gross excess. I hit it with a light. I'll hit the whole tooth of the light for like five seconds. I'll hit the tooth next door for five seconds. I'll hit everything in like five seconds. Then I'll go back and hit from the front and back for like 20 seconds each. And you say, well, that's a lot of curing. Hey, I just want to make sure we have complete polymerization of all of that resin. So call it overkill. I have no problem spending an extra two, three minutes to make sure it's cured to completion. Now, me personally, I'm using a Velo Grand from Ultradent. It's got a 12 millimeter head size, so it covers the whole tooth and then some. So I get some pretty solid curing light action from that device. I, I highly recommend it. Now, if you're going, well, hey, you got a bunch of resin you got to clean off. Yeah, there's a bunch of resin. And so I'm going to go in with various things like these, you know, whether you've got periodontal knives, whether you've got gold foil knives, tungsten carbide carvers from companies like Brassler or a ninja composite instrument from Clinician's Choice, which is the center picture you're looking at. That one's phenomenal for interproximals, um, for the veneers and for your composites, your class two composites. Couldn't recommend a better product, but also a lot of hygiene cleaning instruments I'll use. Okay. So the various sickles I'll go in to clean with. In addition, if I've got a large chunk of resin and it, you, know, you can't break it off because it's too thick, well, then obviously I've got to use something else. I'm going to be very careful, but I'm going to grab a 12 fluted carbide and I'm going to remove the gross excess. And once I get close to the ceramic, I don't want to damage the ceramic, obviously. And that's why we're using carbides. Carbides are significantly less likely to damage ceramic. If you use a diamond, you will definitely damage ceramic. Okay. So if I'm getting close to the resin with my 12 fluted carbide, I'm going to stop. I'm going to switch it out and grab a 30 fluted carbide. That 30 fluted carbide, I can go up and actually touch the porcelain. And if I'm not pressing heavy into it, I can go ahead and rub on the porcelain. It won't really cause any damage. Okay. So again, having the right tools for the right situation. Now from there, you say, well, hey, for me, the biggest spot is, hey, how are you getting that resin from interproximal out, right? You know, that, that's a tough area to get to. And so there's a lot of different manufacturers out there that make the long saws, the interproximal saws, Alternate, Brassler, Axis, Comet, you name it. They all have these long metal blades that basically have teeth along the bottom. They look like a hacksaw, right? Another company known as Contact EZ, they sell these kits also for whether it's polishing interproximal contacts with a fine diamond strip or just a little tiny you know, hacksaw basically to clean out the resin. This is what I would implement. Okay, they're now uh, owned by direct -a dental so you can buy Contact EZ, this interproximal finishing kit from direct -a dental okay? All right, so once we've cleaned everything out, we now have the patient you know, looking great, feeling great. Uh, obviously, we're going to have them back a week later, double check everything, but you know, that's as easy as it is to put things in. And so it's really not that challenging. Once you start to look, look at it and break down the steps and go, okay, if I follow these steps, it becomes very easy. I would say the hardest thing is just making sure you follow the steps properly and put it, you know, proper treatment on the tooth structure as far as your etchant or selective etch uh, and your adhesive. You get those right, it really becomes quite easy. Okay, so in your handout, we got more to talk about, but in your handout, again, I've got this review slide for you. So you have everything in one place. Okay, so that's there for you to review. Now, in the beginning, we said, all right, 
we have options for this one case that had crowns and veneers. We said, okay, for the veneers, we were going to do light cured. Now for the crowns, because we're doing ceramics that cover the whole tooth, we could potentially do cements. But for purposes of this discussion, we said, hey, let's talk about using dual cured adhesives here. Okay. So let's talk about that. Let's say, okay, well, in this case, the light may not penetrate through, let's say a zirconia core, uh, or well, let's pick an opacious core. Let's not talk about zirconia just yet. Um, let's, let's say, you know, like a, a, an opacious ingot of like an Emax, okay? Where your light's not gonna get through, you wanna make sure it cures to completion. Well, then you have to use a dual cured resin, okay? Now you can use them for zirconia as well. But, um, you know, sometimes you may say, well, hey, what about if I'm doing lithium disilicate or lucite, right? Well, pretty much the same steps follow along we just had, except instead of putting a light curable resin inside of your veneer, now it's a dual cure resin you put inside the crown. So all the steps we just talked about are exactly the same. And you're going, wow, okay, that's, that's pretty darn easy. It is. You're just substituting one syringe that's light curable for a dual cure syringe, okay? So for all your inlays, onlays, and veneers that you were using maybe light cured, if, if the light can't get through it, and you go, well, I just got to change it to a dual cure. Well, perfect. I'll just add the dual link from Bisco, okay? Now, where's the big change? The big change is if I'm doing zirconia, I'm going to change up a step in here. And that's the part that confuses a lot of people because a lot of people use zirconia nowadays. And so we're going to hit on that one right now. Okay. So I just want to make sure distinction there for using all the other porcelains. It's really no different. The techniques basically the same. Okay. All right. So let's talk about this. If we were doing zirconia, how is that going to be different? Well, it's going to be significantly different. So let's look at that. So here we had our case we talked about earlier. Here's our preps. So you go, okay, well, the veneers are easy. So I'm just doing the same steps you already talked about. I can either do the two veneers by themselves or I can do them one at a time. And once they're in, I can go do the crowns. Or you can say, well, wait, wait, can I do the crowns first? Certainly can. You put the crowns in first and then do the veneers last, right? Makes no difference. Okay. Me personally, I want to put the veneers on first, and then I'm going to do the crowns later. All right. So again, the steps are very much the same as far as how we handle the tooth structure. The difference being how we handle the ceramic when it's a zirconia. Okay. And that's where everyone has kind of these heard these different stories of how you manage things. And so I want to clear that up right now to make it simple for you. Okay. So the next time you have exposure to it, you know, that's going to be easy. All right. So here's obviously the final. So I want you to see this, but I'm going to tell you how we put it in, obviously. Uh, so we have all these different veneers, implants, and crowns, and we've got them all to look the same, even though we're using different types of materials. Okay. So we got a screw retain implant, which really doesn't apply for what we're talking about here. But then we have the Albon Universal on uh, six, eight, and 10, right? With the dual resin cement. And then on the two veneers we had six or sorry, nine and 11, we've got the Albon Universal and the Choice 2 veneer cement, okay? So really, if, if we were doing like Emacs here for all of these, the system really wasn't any different, okay? It, all we did was we changed out a dual barrel for a single barrel. Now, again, if it was zirconia, it'd be handled different. So understand that there's a difference, but otherwise this becomes very simplistic. If I've got to just make sure a little light gets through, let's say an Emacs crown here, that I went to a dual cure, okay? I can't stress that enough, it's very simple. All right, the cool thing about it is with the dual link universal, as well as the light cured uh, choice two, you're using the same bonding agent. You're not having to add extra um, steps or extra bottles. It works with the systems, okay? Which is great. All right, so quick and easy to clean up, high conversion rate, looks great on the radiographs, low film thickness, easy to seat things, and you've got, uh, an A2 shade, a universal shade, as well as a milky white, should you need one. Again, I think the universal works just fine for all of what I do. All right. So easy to clean up also, because I know a lot of times people go, hey, how hard is it to clean that stuff up? Very easy. All right. If you decide that, hey, you know, Snyder's using the dual cure, it sounds like something I want to look into. Again, in your handout, I got some extra slides in here. They're straight from Bisco. Okay. So the question, you know, as far as uh, what adhesive can I use with dual link? They've got an answer for you. Do I need to pre-treat the surfaces of my indirect restorations? It's in there for you. This is all for zirconia though, okay? Notice this slide says zirconia because that's where we're going next. So I was talking about using regular ceramics, Emacs, Lucites, Lithium Disilicates, Feldspathics, okay? Now we're switching gears. Recognize I just switched gears, okay? We're talking about zirconia. 
So it's answering some questions here for zirconia because the next slide I'm going to show you, uh, the, next, or the second slide will be more on zirconia. So again, this is straight from the manufacturer. Okay, so these are for you to see that it's a great product, been around for a long time, uh, great results, good strengths, and again, easy to implement. All right, so here's a crown doing zirconia. Okay, so we've got that dual link, dual cure, cures in the dark, but this time we're doing a zirconia crown. Okay, so we got dentin. Well, a lot of the same steps are going to apply with a slight twist. So the same thing, remove the temporary restoration, clean the tooth, trying with a water soluble try and paste. After doing that, you're going to clean the tooth, clean the restoration, you're going to isolate it again. So again, you'll see that all those steps are the same. Exactly. Okay. From there, your restoration, your zirconia crown should have come back from the laboratory, sandblasted. In other words, we don't have to etch the zirconia because the etching doesn't work. The zirconia has to be air abraded. So a lab's doing that for you typically. Just make sure they are. You want to double check from them. But if for some reason that the lab didn't or you had to somehow adjust something, okay, well, here's a slide for you to review as far as the size of particles, the pressure, how much time, what angle and what distance you need. A lot of specifics, but they're there for a reason, okay? So your Danville micro etcher, probably use that and follow those protocols. Now, what is the big difference here? You tried in ceramic in the tooth, instead of just uh, hitting it with a steam cleaner or an ultrasonic water bath, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, in this case, zirconia is special, it has to be handled differently. And this is where a lot of the concern comes in is we've all heard of Ibaclean from Ibaclar. There's also Zirclean from Bisco. And so what these do is they're phosphate scavengers. So after trying it in the mouth, you have saliva contaminants, which have phosphates. The phosphates basically take up some of the, the surface area. So it inhibits the resins from grabbing onto the zirconia. Okay. So you have a potentially contaminated surface that we can't bond to. So you have to clean these off. Okay. So in utilizing either one of these, we're cleaning the zirconia after having tried it in. So again, when you get your hand out to be able to go back and answer questions, have fact sheets in front of you. This is why I put these in here. Again, straight from Bisco. Do I need to decontaminate my zirconia crown after trying in? Of course you do, okay? With any product you're using. Can I use Zirclean on porcelain or glass ceramics? Yes, you can, okay? So you can clean all your ceramics with Zirclean as well. All right, so if we've cleaned the ceramic, now instead of putting a silane on, because we talked about silanes earlier, remember we said it was pre-hydrolyzed or it was a dual bottle system, okay? Silanes are different we use those on ceramics, okay? So lucites, lithium disilicons, feldpathic porcelains, okay? Now, in the case of zirconia, we're using something different. We're using a ceramic primer, which is different than a silane. I wanna point that out. They are not interchangeable. Now, your ceramic primer has what's known as MDP inside of it. It's a big, long chemical uh, product that has a long name. And what this does, it allows us to adhere to metal oxides, okay? And so you're using this to grab onto zirconia. So it's acting like your silanes, but it's a ceramic primer. It's compatible with both your light cure and your dual cured resin looting cements. And it's in a single bottle. So you don't have to mix anything. Uh, you don't have to have an extra system. Now you may say, okay, well, ceramic primers. There's a lot of them on the market, okay? Bisco has their Zine Prime Plus, but whether it's Alterdent, Densply, Karari, GC, they all have them, okay? They will all work interchangeably. Now, me personally, I would tell you, I would stay within one company and use their products as far as their, you know, uh, adhesive, their resin loading cements, their silanes, their ceramic primers. I personally would like to stay with all those just to make sure you don't make any mistakes because sometimes there's one extra step that a company will throw in that might throw you a curveball. So again, to keep it simple, I would stay within a manufacturer's product range. All right. So a couple other facts here. After dispensing the Z Prime Plus, you may say, well, hey, how much time do I have with this? Well, it is light sensitive. So obviously once you dispense it, you wanna use it, okay? Uh, you may say, well, hey, you know, how early can I put this on? Okay, well, you can put it on up to six months ahead of time. Okay, so you get plenty of working time there also. You know, someone else may say, hey, do I have to shake this stuff? And you don't have to shake it, okay? So again, when you go back to the handout and you say, well, what did you say for this? What was that? That's why I throw these in here, okay? And they're just very simple, straight from the manufacturer. So I've got a zirconia crown in here, right? We, we're trying it in, we're using, a, we clean the tooth, we've done a water soluble try and paste. And so here's again, a cheat sheet for you. The sandblast, it should be sandblasted by the lab. You can see on the far left side, if I've tried it in, I'm then gonna decontaminate it, clean it, clean, removing the phosphates. 
with Zerclean or IvaClean, right? Then after having used that, I've got to rinse it off. Me personally, I told you I use a steam cleaner. And then I've got to put on the ceramic primer, which is that Z Prime Plus that has the MDP inside of it. Now you may say, okay, well, simple. It is simple, okay? But if for some reason, let's say the restoration uh, hadn't been sandblasted by the laboratory and you have to do it, no problem. It's easy to do. You got your Danville micro etcher. So you're going to try the restoration in. After having tried it in, you're going to sandblast it. And I gave you the cheat sheet earlier in that one slide. You're then going to clean it with the Zerclean. You're going to rinse that out. You're then going to apply your ceramic primer, the Z Prime Plus. Okay. So the ceramic's been treated. It's ready to go. Very simple. From here, you're going to go ahead and grab your dual link universal. You're going to now inject that into the crown and you're going to seat the crown. Okay. So all the steps on the two structure were the same, just a slightly different twist on how we manage the ceramic, right? Otherwise, it's the same system we had already looked at. So again, trying to keep simple with our systems is what this whole program was about. So the adhesives on the tooth, no pooling. We hit it with a light. We then use our dual cure resin in the crown after treating it with all those steps. You can see it on the slide, right? And then we wipe off the gross excess, leaving some behind. Okay, I don't like to take it all away in case I pull some out of my margin. From there, we go ahead and cure it, okay? You hit it with a light, and if your light doesn't penetrate, well, that's why you use a dual cure. You're allowing it to set up on its own, okay? Now you may say, okay, these steps are, are really simple, but hey, you know, what if I'm using a different system? Like what if I'm using Ivoclar or Densply or GC or Karari? They all have a system. Their systems are all very similar, yet they're their own unique chemistries, okay? So even though I'm talking about Bisco and all this, because I personally use Bisco, but I've used all of these. I have all these, okay? It, Bisco is my favorite because I like the way it handles. I like the thought process in the systems. I like the research behind it. And so that's why I implement it, okay? So again, for the most part, everything still applies to these, but that's why I said having one system to go through the whole process to keep it simplistic for you, that you're not having to worry about chemistries, each manufacturer has kind of figured out their own, okay? All right. So Bisco said, hey, you know, for anyone in my programs this whole year, they're giving people 20% off, you buy direct from Bisco. So if you decide like, hey, I want to use what Snyder's using, then be my guest. I get nothing from it. I'm just throwing this up for them, okay? So they're obviously the manufacturer that's supporting tonight's webinar so we can have a discussion. Hence, I throw this slide up as a courtesy for them to, for us to be here and have this free uh, exchange of ideas and concepts. From there, if you like the way I approach things, you want to learn more, things that we don't talk about in dentistry as far as how to run a business, uh, to be more successful, to have better marketing and advertising, to do things substantially different than you hear other dentists doing, well, that's one of the things I teach inside of my group known as Legion. We do things significantly different, okay? Now, I mentioned a handout. How do you get a handout? Well, the one slide you might want to write down or take a picture of is this one here. It's known as Den Tools. This is where I put all of my lectures from every week that I'm out lecturing or doing webinars, this is where they all go. It's all free for you. So Den Tools with a Z. What happens when you go to Den Tools? Well, dentools.com is nothing more than a website. So when you go to the website, you're going to enter your information. It's going to automatically generate an email back to you. If you don't see it, that means it went into your spam or junk folder. So this is what the website looks like. You put in your name and your email. You can add any questions or comments you want. Uh, it's got my social media links if you want to follow along as well. But when you fill this out, it'll give you access. Okay, It gives you access by sending you an email again. Okay, So when you fill this out, it sends you an email with a link. That link takes you to here. It's a hidden page. This hidden page says, hey, congratulations, you made it. It's very easy to do. On that page, as you scroll down that page, are many different companies I work with and or products or just free information, like this one that says 34 ways to increase patient retention. Just stuff I think are great to share with my colleagues that I think are beneficial. As you move down the page, there's a bunch of different lectures I've given, and uh, I, I usually scrape them off every couple of weeks because otherwise the page would be crazy long. Yours being the most recent will be at the bottom of the page. And so you'll see that little blue underlined highlighted area which says click here for a handout or click here to learn more. Just click on anything on that entire page. All of it is yours for free. I get nothing from it other than just sharing with everyone, okay? So every slide I showed you will be in your handout. It's already posted. Now, that being said, you probably have some questions. I noticed a few showing up. So I'm going to answer questions now. Uh, but my email's up here. The website is there. And social media links are there in your handout. 
The PDF handout you get, it is digital, it is active, meaning that if you click on any of those icons, it'll take you to my social media, okay? All right, so let's look at some questions here. Someone asked me, uh, what causes the black band under a temporary? Uh, is there any way to prevent that? The black band usually, I would say 99% of the time, is someone's using a hemostatic agent to stop the bleeding or control the bleeding, and that hemostatic is iron-based. That iron-based hemostatic will oxidize. And as it oxidizes, in other words, it's rusting, it changes colors, it turns black, okay? Uh, that's 99% of the time. If you do a temporary well, there really should be no leakage under it. You don't even need to use temporary cements. Now, if you wanna know more about how I do my temporary cement or my temporary um, restorations, as I mentioned, there is a free webinar that I did for Catapult about veneers. I think it was called the nuts and bolts of veneers. I believe it was earlier this year, but if you go back into their catalog, uh, and look up either my name or veneers, I'm sure you can find it. So I think I went into that uh, as far as your discussion on temporaries, because we weren't really covering that tonight, but I want to answer your question. All right, next question is, um, do I use the porcelain bonding resin after silanating? Yes, so the unfilled resin goes on after the silane. So that acts like a surfactant, you could say. So the resin is going to flow more easily. So when you put that on there, you do not want that pooled. I will air thin that to get it as thin as possible. Now in air thinning it, guess what happens? That unfilled resin goes around on the other side and now you have a slimy veneer that's hard to hold. So you're going to have to wipe off the other side. Okay. So be careful in how you blow things. All right. Uh, next question. So someone asked the question of after applying Zerclean or Ivoclean uh, to clean the zirconia crown, can monobond by Ivoclare be used as a primer? Uh, yes, they do recommend that in their product, uh, in, their, in their system. So if you're using Ivoclare's product line, yes. Uh, me personally, uh, if I was using my systems, uh, I would not be using that product uh, just because of my personal uh, beliefs in the Z Prime Plus. Uh, it's a different chemistry. They are not the same. I happen to like the chemistry of the Bisco product better. Uh, but if you're using the complete Ivoclar system, just following the protocols that I had shown you, and where I implemented a Bisco product, you implement the Ivoclar product, yes, their system works very well, okay? So I don't want to say like not to use it. I just, I wouldn't implement into the system. Again, keep it all amongst one manufacturer to keep it ideal. Uh, next question down here at the bottom of my page. Does all bond universal have to be cured prior to seating? Good question. Thank you for bringing that one up. No, it does not. Does not. You could sandwich everything together and cure it all as one, right? And that's how we did veneers for many years when we had thicker film thicknesses of bonding agent. Because if you cured it, it wouldn't seat, okay? Now, part of the reason we cure the bonding agent first is because you get a tug of war inside between the ceramic and the tooth. The light's starting on the outside if you're coming from the front. And so the ceramic and resin are hardening first, right? And since they're hardening first, you're always going to get a little bit of a tug of war. And so potentially you have the risk of small micro areas where something is no longer uh, looted to the tooth properly. Versus if you loot that first layer down on the tooth, and now you loot the ceramic to that tooth structure, the tug of war is something that's already sealed with this resin now trying to grab onto it, okay? So that's why we typically bond that first layer. With the, uh, but if you, again, if you want to sandwich the whole thing, you can totally do that as well. So great question to ask. All right. Um, can you use all bond to repair chipped porcelain or zirconia? Uh, yes, you can. Okay, so it's a universal bonding agent. Now, in treating the ceramic, that's a totally different process, but you know, it's really not much different than what we're talking about veneers. So if you've got a feldspathic porcelain or a, or a uh, lithium disilicate, you know, you're gonna obviously have to isolate extremely well and etch that ceramic. Uh, once you've uh, etched the ceramic, you can apply a ceramic primer or a silane, again, based on what it is, uh, and then apply your bonding agent hit it with a curing light and then apply your composite or loot the piece of ceramic. Maybe if you've got the ceramic, grab the choice too and loot that piece of ceramic back on. The ceramic would have had it been treated just like a veneer, but you can sandwich. We've done that before where we sandwich ceramics together and loot something back into place. Or maybe we've got a crown substructure and we loot a veneer onto the crown substructure. Uh, so yes, you can use it for that. 
know, how long does the effectiveness of MDP last when cementing a zirconia crown? Uh, well, as far as when I, I think we're talking about the ceramic primer, when I was painting on, I said you had six months uh, of ability to put it on and leave it there. I think that's what you were asking. Please discuss treatment of restoration surfaces that require occlusal adjustment after looting. Okay, sure. So we've glued something onto the tooth and now we have to adjust the ceramic. Okay, so usually I'll use a fine diamond burr to adjust. And so I'm using um, troll foil 4.5 micron articulating paper. Have them bite down, mark the area. So it's very accurate because it's thin. I grab a fine diamond. Okay. And then I'll go ahead and adjust that spot. And then after I've adjusted, anytime you adjust ceramic, you got to go back and polish. I don't care if it's zirconia, feldspathic, lucite, lithium disilicate. So you're going to need a polishing kit, whether it's Brassler, Axis, Comet, you name it, you, uh, you need a kit. Me personally in the mouth, I like Clinician's Choice. I also like Ultradent, uh, but there's a lot of systems out there, but you're going to have to polish it. Usually it has a couple wheels or a couple points uh, that you're going to want to go back and polish the ceramic. Okay. Uh, all right. So that being said, I hope you got a couple of pearls out of this. Get yourself a handout and uh, that way you can review it and have all the instructions in front of you. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all again at another Catapult webinar. They do a great job of putting on these programs for us. Uh, it's nice to get together for free and be able to discuss things and get information to propel us all forward and do better for our patients. Again, they have a vast library of a number of different topics from many of my colleagues. Lots of great information there. So make sure you go in and get some more information for yourself. All right, have a great night. Thanks so much for Catapult. Thanks for Bisco.